So without further delay, I would like to introduce uh, our main speaker, Professor Dr. Miroslav Wolf. He is the Henry B. Wright Professor for Systematic Theology at the Yale University, and he's also the founder and director of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. Uh, Miroslav Wolf has become famous for his books. Uh, the latest one that I have here are just a few that I would like to mention. They are also available at the book table. Allah, a Christian response, which was a uh, result of the uh, dialogue, uh, the word, uh, common word among us uh, between Muslim and Christian scholars, and then his reflection on that. Free of charge, giving and forgiving in a culture striped of grace. Then an older book, uh, not old, but older in sequence. <laughs> After our likeness, the church as the image of the Trinity. And probably the most famous book, or the most, I take it also the most sold book, Exclusion and Embrace, a theological exploration of identity, otherness, and reconciliation from 1996, which uh, gained the prestigious Grammar Award um, in 1902, uh, uh, sorry, 2002. Miroslav is born, um, Professor Wolf is born 1956 in the today Croatia, he studied in Zagreb at in Fuller Theological Seminary Theology. He got his doctorate and habilitated with Jürgen Moltmann, as was already mentioned, in Tübingen. He is a member of the Episcopal Church in the USA and uh, Evangelical Church in Croatia. So he's holding different tensions together in his life and in his work. He's engaged in different ecumenical and interfaith uh, dialogues. His actual uh, interest of research has to do with faith and globalization. There is a book coming out this fall. We were vaguely hoping, but it's this fall, uh, about the themes of this conference. So we are actually really ahead. We get the most actual research available at this time from, from Miroslav Wolf. Um, and uh, the interest in particular is about rec conciliations between people, people groups, and then a theological anthropology of human flourishing. That would be his main theme. And it's a great honor for us to receive Professor Rolf. I think we can do that with a very warm welcome. Dear friends, <clears throat> I'm immensely grateful to be able to stand here before you. Uh, I wish I had a long list of all different constituencies that uh, my friend Walter has read at the beginning of his speech, so I can recognize all of you that are here and express my gratitude. But my special gratitude now to uh, Mr. Dean uh, for his introductory uh, remarks. Um, I, I will speak in English, and I hope uh, I will be understandable to you. If I'm going too fast, translators will keep track of me and slow me down. But in case some of you feel that it's going too fast, don't hesitate to interrupt me. I will try to speak relatively freely. I will not read uh, a text, and I hope that will uh, bring to fore some of the liveliness of the subject itself, but also will reflect my own sense that uh, on these issues of religions and globalization, we can make only tentative kinds of uh, remarks. And the um, topic uh, is, uh, as I understand it, relation between world religions and globalization. This is world religions on one side and globalization processes on the other though both are, of course, intertwined, and then relations between religions, among religions, within the context of globalization. Now, once you put the subject in those terms, you suddenly realize that you have to be uh, uh, roughly at Jungfrau Joch level to survey the things down in the valley in order to see how uh, these large phenomena relate to one another. In other words, or you can put it differently, in order to gain perspective, you almost have to squint a little bit <laughs> so that all the distracting details can be 
uh, pushed out and you can see the phenomena uh, in, in their contours. Now there's obviously a risk in doing something like this because they are, most of us live in everyday realities and all of us are easily then asked, well, how about this? How about this exception here? And so I um, urge you or um, ask you to follow me in trying to see the realities uh, at a little bit greater distance in order to take stock of, of what is happening on the global level. You know, as I was working on this book, in some ways I thought to myself, Nobody is able to write a book like this, and everybody who attempts to write a book like this is a fool. Uh, everybody who attempts it will get a variety of objections for, from all different, uh, different sides. Um, so in the book that I have, uh, I have written, one third of the entire text are footnotes, trying to guard myself from objections from all different sides. Now, you won't get any of the footnotes in these lectures. <laughs> you will get a brief summary of the content uh, of the book, but I trust that in discussions that we will have, you can raise the questions. We can ask both how what I'm trying to argue here fits into more academic perspective on the topic, and also how it might relate to the kind of realities of ordinary, uh, ordinary life. <clears throat> so, um, I'll continue with a few preliminary uh, remarks. Uh, and that is, um, one of the things that I'm doing in, this, uh, in these lectures and in the book is I'm writing explicitly from a Christian perspective. Now, uh, the, the reason for this is that I believe that there is no such a thing as a neutral perspective on the topics that we are discussing. I cannot survey landscape as if I were a drone <laughs> and then objectively described. And by the way, drones are flown for particular interest, right? <laughs> they themselves are not neutral. So neutral perspective is unavailable, unavailable to us. Maybe even more significantly, neutral perspective would not be very helpful because people on the ground, they don't have a neutral perspective. They have their own perspectives, and if we ought to honor people and their communities, we must take into account perspectives of uh, people themselves. And so what I'm trying to do here, obviously I recognize that Christian faith is one perspective among many in this world. I happen to be a Christian, I think it's a true perspective, but I think we are living in a situation of what I call univer uh, uh, a multiple particular universalisms, right? So we don't have just one universalism around. All world religions are universalist, quote unquote, ideologies, and so we live in, and each of them is particular, right? From particular vantage points are articulating the position. So in a world of particular universalisms, we have to think about relationship between all of these universalisms. And I think the only way that I know how to do it is to kind of forge almost a novel way of, of approaching religions, and that is to say to try from a Christian perspective to describe how I think resources of these particular religions, resources that particular religions have for living well together and engaging globalization processes. So you see what I'm doing. I'm not telling, saying simply what Christians believe. I'm saying what from Christian perspective I can construe that Muslims, Buddhists, and so forth, forth will believe and how they might be able to act in a globalized world. Am I too fast? Slow down, Mr. Wolf, okay. <laughs> Now, let's see. I need to make sure that this art has not been uh, disturbed by my jacket. <laughs> but I can put it here. That's good. Excellent. So in a sense, just to summarize, it's a Christian reading of how other religions and Christianity ought to relate to one another. Now, that's a complicated endeavor. It's controversial also endeavor, but I think that we need to attempt such an endeavor. And I'm hopeful 
that this is not just that what I do is one attempt to articulate these relationships. Other religions will have their own contributions to make. And I think that the dialogue, it's the first word, in a sense, in the dialogue. Um, let me now define the terms just a little bit. So first, globalization. Now, what do we mean by globalization? I can give you very quick features of globalizations, globalization, and they would look something like this. We live in a world of very high level of interconnectivity. Information, goods, services, they all flow increasingly freely. Perhaps even more significant is that we live in a world where interdependence is planetary in scope. And there are very few independent locales. And those that are there are rapidly vanishing. And I think this independence is in some ways even more important feature than interconnectivity. We live in a time of contracted, what some, some sociologists call contracted social space, so that the entire planet is becoming a new locality. We all live under the same roof in a certain sense, which obviously creates significant difficulties. If you try to put different families under the same roof uh, and people don't have very discrete spaces of, of their own, uh, this is a recipe for tensions. We live also in a time of when time has sped up. Time is speeding. With technological and cultural innovations coming, coming at us at increasing speed. Now, just as a footnote for religions and for traditional ways of living, that presents a significant problem. Because time is moving so fast sometimes that we don't have enough time to stabilize traditions, to pass them on also. And we live in a time of a widespread consciousness of a world as a single whole. So it's not enough to have interconnectivity, interdependence, shrinking of time, shrinking of space. We have to have a sense, we have a sense of living in a world as a single whole. Now, of course, the world is marked not just by these formal features, but also by very deep tensions just on account of these features. Um, for instance, it's marked by unprecedented economic growth, but is shadowed by growing disparity in wealth. It's marked by increasing awareness of ecological endangerment. We have heard about this earlier, but also at the same time by disappearance of entire species and by high level of fragility of many of the natural habitats. Spread of the rule of law, I think, but at the same time, it, that clashes with strengthening of global criminal networks and local outbursts of violence. So you can name many of these tensions that characterize uh, our world today. Now, these are some of the features of globalization processes. Um, it's important to keep in mind who are the drivers of globalization. Uh, what pushes and drives globalization processes. A colleague of mine by the name of Nayan Chanda has written a book on globalization, and he thinks that globalization begins basically with the beginning of humanity itself, that human beings are inherently globalizers. I'm not sure whether he's right about the beginnings of globalization, but he identifies, I think helpfully, uh, in a very simple way, uh, four drivers of globalization throughout uh, the centuries. He says those were preachers, traders, adventurers, and warriors. Right. They kind of pushed out to connect with others to, and then connect the world as a whole. 
I think in today's environment, the main driver of globalization processes, I think in, especially since the colonization of Americas, the main drivers of globalization processes were the traders. Current economic, current globalization is economically driven process. Now that's also a controversial claim, and obviously economy is not the only, uh, is the only thing that drives globalization processes, but it is a fundamental one, free market economy. And another feature of globalization connected with um, economic emphasis on economy is that globalization uh, is marked by what philosopher Charles Taylor has called affirmation of ordinary life. Everyday life is gaining on significance. Um, ordinary life isn't as it was in the Middle Ages, as it was earlier uh, also. It isn't kind of infrastructure for some more important life than ordinary to take place. Rather, the ordinary life is what things are all about. Health, wealth, longevity, uh, and so forth. Now, a few comments on world religions. Is the speed okay? Slow down. Ay, 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 okay. I will try. <laughs> um, let me try to define uh, a, a bit what I mean by world, by religions and in particular, what I mean by world religions. Now, some of you who are religious studies uh, uh, students or teachers, you will recognize that, world, uh, that, that even the word religion is controversial today. Um, there are some people who think that religions were invented, and they were invented uh, in the modernity, that before modernity there weren't such a thing as religions. Or there are people who say there is no such a thing as world religions also. I will not in enter into a long debate about this. I want to uh, indicate to you how I'm using those terms. Now, the so-called world religion, and by this I mean Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and so forth, uh, they are distinct from what some people describe as local religions, or what other people described, uh, Theo Sundemeyer in Heidelberg, for instance, as primary religions. And they have certain features which I will explore in next, um, in next lecture. And they have emerged in what one of the great Swiss philosophers, Karl Jaspers, has called axial age. Now, I don't particularly like to talk about axial age because it doesn't seem to me that there was such a specific age of emergence of those religions. I rather talk together with uh, Robert Bella and Hans Jos about axial transformations. In the context of axial transformation, all the great world religions of today has emerged. And one of the features of these religions, and this will be very significant uh, in, the, in the following lectures, is that they have what Friedrich Nietzsche has called two worlds account of reality. Now, he uh, described this in a negative critical way, I want to ascribe it, describe it in a positive, take it up in a positive way. By this he meant, and I mean, that all world religion, Christianity certainly included, they distinguish in the entirety of the reality between transcendent and mundane realms. That's the two worlds. They also, all of them, Christian faith included, give primacy to the transcendent realm. Transcendent has primacy over mundane, and mundane realm, to be itself, somehow has to align itself with the transcendent realm. Now, they do not deny significance of the ordinary realm, mundane realities. Very few are, in fact, so radically ascetical. Maybe Buddhism in certain, certainly Buddhism in certain forms, but increasingly not so today. You have illustration of this would be something like engaged Buddhism. Right? It's a very significant movement 
uh, in, in Buddhism uh, represented by many significant figures today. Of course, different religions, they understand what affirmation of ordinary life means in different ways. Let me give you an illustration. Now, you might say that women being required or feeling the need to wear veil seems somehow life suppressing, right? And from Western perspective, it certainly looks like that. Most of my friends, women friends, wouldn't dream of putting a veil. But if you look at it from Muslim perspective, they in fact think that this is a form of affirmation of the ordinary life, not the suppression of ordinary life. This is a form of protecting the ordinary life. You might say, as a Western, I don't need this kind of a protection. Uh, as, as, as somebody who is a Muslim, you might think somewhat differently. You might think that precisely our, the way our culture encourages women to behave is suppressing the actual dignity of women. So you see the discussion is not whether one affirms the other denies life, but it's from different perspectives. Both are concerned to affirm ordinary life, just that they have a clashing perspectives on what that means. And that's precisely the challenge that we are facing today. Now, there are many ways in which religions press against globalization. And that's the main topic of the, of the lecture this morning. How, in what ways religions are a challenge for globalization, in what ways they need to press globalization processes. Now, John Paul II, when he gave a speech at the United Nations, his speech about globalization can be summed up in the following phrase, globalization without marginalization. There's a sense that globalization processes, though they're unifying the world, they're at the same time marginalizing great many people. They are bringing prosperity to some, but to, uh, to others, they're driving into deep, uh, deep poverty. And so one of the things that uh, world faiths, uh, Dalai Lama has expressed things in a similar way, certainly John Paul and others, we need to press the question of in what ways globalization is marginalizing people and therefore denying them their rights, denying them their dignity, denying them their means of, very means of sustenance. Um, uh, the other watchword of many religions is globalization without planetary destruction, right? And that was highlighted at the beginning of this speech. Globalization has, the market-driven globalization, has this tendency to disregard uh, nature, to disregard the creation, has a tendency not to think in long terms, but to think of short terms of uh, acquisition of profit, and therefore has tendency to be destructive toward, toward nature. Globalization, the other watchword might be globalization without worship of mammon. And you might find that often among Muslim uh, critics of globalization, and especially is centered around the question of usury. Uh, the, the worship of God, of profit, uh, especially in the financial uh, industries of today, uh, is a destructive thing for the entirety of human communities. Uh, that would be the argument. I think those are all very important uh, areas in which to press globalization. Now, I don't see anywhere a clock. Um, so let, let me try to set up my clock here, and then I can make sure that I don't go over time. There we go. <laughs> now, what I want to, uh, uh, affirming these ways in which I think uh, Christian faith, but other religion, press against globalization, uh, and uh, require globalization to transform itself, in a sense. Uh, I want to zero in on the reminder of my time uh, here on one of the, what I would describe, most important uh, issues that we are facing today. And that is, you may be, may be surprised to think of this this way. I hope by the end you will be persuaded. That is really a question of meaning. The question of to what end 
the entire process of globalization driven economically, to what end is it there? And I'm taking cue here from the uh, book of Ecclesiastes in the Bible. And the book asks, at the very heart of it, asks a very pointed question. And the book, or the writer, who himself um, is uh, Warren Buffett of his time, who himself is a person of immense achievement and wealth, he asks, what is the gain of gain? And that's the fundamental question, I think, that we need to ask, that religions also ask, with regard to globalization uh, processes. Now, I want to explore this question also in conjunction with, uh, obviously, with the question of nihilism. I mean, there is no meaning. You have a kind of nihilistic um, worldview or nihilistic practice in operation. So I'll address this question in dialogue with, I think, a person who is, um, our, gives us our best insight, insights into uh, nihilism. And the first time when this issue occurred to me as significant for globalization processes is um, in the con conjunction of two engagements that I have had. One was <clears throat> during the 9-11 attacks on the Twin Towers, World Trade Center. I was at that time in New York City. I was giving a lecture at an international prayer breakfast uh, at United Nations. And the topic of my lecture was reconciliation. And the argument of my lecture was that Christian faith, but other faiths as well, I was talking primarily about Christian faith, have resources to bring reconciliation to the world. I was about three minutes into finishing my talk when the first plane hit uh, one of the, uh, the towers. Right? And that airplane delivered almost irrefutable proof that I was wrong. <laughs> that religions, or if not that I was wrong, then that religions have not only potential for reconciliation, to bring reconciliation, but have indubitable potential to bring about destruction in the name of one God, with the support and legitimation of one God, here the struggle is being engaged and here destruction is being, uh, is being sowed. Um, in the middle of the, obviously, Western uh, symbols of Western power. This was a powerful experience for me because uh, it took me a while before I left New York. I was observing uh, from where we were how streets were gradually being emptied of people and finally uh, what was a bustling city was simply devoid of all the people. You could, uh, you could ride the bike counter traffic in this five lane uh, Fifth Avenue, right? That was what New York was immediately after that. And I wasn't, I was in, in the United Nations, I wasn't even close to the, the epicenter of the event itself. So that's kind of a one, one experience. This is kind of religion gone violent, religion gone nihilistic, if you want, right? Now the other experience was I was for a number of years involved in global, uh, as a member of one of the global councils of the World Economic Forum. And the charge that we have received from Klaus Schwab for these uh, global, uh, global uh, uh, agenda councils of which I was a member is to not just improve the state of the world, which is the uh, slogan of the World Economic Forum, but uh, to participate in global redesign project. That was our, our goal. Okay, I thought, well, I'll participate as much as I, uh, as my, as I can as a theologian. And I participated in sections on religions, uh, sections on, on values, and we talked about many important things. Uh, obviously, the crisis was primarily financial, so we talked about uh, finance industry, regulation of finance industry. We talked about security risks. We talked about uh, ecological issues. Lineup of issues was, was, was all there. One significant thing was missing. 
we never addressed the question of human desire. That which in many ways drives the entire economic process, that in many, which in many ways has contributed most explicitly to the crisis itself, a crisis of lending and crisis of borrowing, remained in, the, in that context completely unaddressed. And a kind of a sense that uh, desire ought to be just let go and be respected as a desire, maybe simply framed a bit, but never profound, or never in a significant way steered. That kind of question of leaving desire as desire is struck me as another form of nihilism in which we find ourselves today. I'm shaking the world here as I speak. This is good. <laughs> I, I, I have actually arranged this to be done uh, uh, right at this spot, just to add dramatic emphasis on what we are doing here. So as I mentioned earlier, our best guide about nihilism is, I think, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche. As you know, he was the son and grandson of Lutheran ministers. Uh, and he lost faith when, after a first semester of studying theology. Now, uh, so, so <laughs> warning, <laughs> when you study theology, it might happen to, to you, or it might deepen your faith. Actually, most, mostly, I was, I was attempted to, I'm attempted to make a footnote about study of theology. <laughs> um, uh, texts have footnotes. Uh, lectures also should have footnotes. <laughs> They're called digressions, right? And in some ways, I think uh, all the study of theology uh, often leads to something that appears like a crisis, and it's important to go through this crisis to a new level of understanding. I remember that I myself, at an evangelical institution, almost lost faith studying theology, right? I was almost ended up as Nietzsche. His most famous book is uh, Genealogy of Morals, as you know, and he argued that world religions, notably Judaism and Christianity, are kind of culturally complex forms of resentment. Resentment of the weak against the strong. Now, he himself never wrote much about religion and violence, but it's not hard to see how resentful weak, if they gain enough power, will try to deploy lethal violence against those who they find morally unacceptable. Now, Nietzsche himself was much more concerned with these kind of pervasive, low-intensity violence, which he considered to be the very nature of world religion, certainly Christianity. Now, building on Nietzsche, others have argued that true believers must reject ordinary life. They must reject it as a mere refuse compared to transcendent realities, or they must kind of bleach out the value from ordinary life because transcendent realm has a primacy over the mundane realm. Probably the best example that some of the critics um, bring about, uh, there is a book uh, entitled All, Th All Things Shining by Dreyfus and Kelly. And they give as an example Dante's Divine Comedy. Those of you who've read Dante's Divine Comedy, you know that greatest epic poem, I think, ever composed. Uh, in that poem, Beatrice, who was the great, one true, great, abiding love of Dante's life, right? Beatrice leads Dante through the celestial uh, realms all the way to the beatific vision of God. But once Dante beholds God, the argument goes, suddenly the love for Beatrice disappears. And that becomes an example how attachment to God devalues ordinary realities, make them, makes them irrelevant. And Nietzsche called this the passive nihilism 
off-world religions. In their most zealous form, passive nihilists, religious passive nihilists, they kill infidels and blasphemers. In their weary form, tired form, they act like Buddhists do, Nietzsche believed, where they give up even on desiring this world. But somewhere in the middle, they exist. Um, nihilism squelches the life and kills ordinary joys. Now, Nietzsche's, uh, object of Nietzsche's critic, critique were not just world religions. He was mocking very bitterly, probably as bitterly as you could, what he called the last men. The type of human beings he feared would be the end result of Western way of life, Western civilization. In Das Bog Zarathustra, uh, there's a section on the last men. Some of you have uh, read it. Uh, it bears repeating because it is a diagnostic of much of what's happening, I believe, uh, in the context of a globalized world. Nietzsche writes, the earth has become small and on it hops the last man who makes everything small. We have invented happiness, say the last men, and they blink. A little poison now and then, that makes for pleasant dreams, and much poison at the end for pleasant death. One still works, for work is a form of entertainment, but one is careful lest the entertainment be too harrowing. One no longer becomes poor or rich. Both require too much exertion. Who still wants to rule? Who to obey? Both require too much exertion. Formerly, all the world was mad, say the most refined, and they blink. One has one's little pleasure for the day and a little pleasure for the night but one has regard for one's health. We have invented happiness, say the last men, and they blink. Now, many of us in the West, or wherever the Western ways of life prevail, are a bit like Nietzsche's last men, weary of all great striving, obsessed with comfort, obsessed with safety, we're dreaming our petty dreams and enjoying our pleasures, entertaining ourselves to idiocy while imagining ourselves as the measure of humanity. Now, many of us aren't such last men. Many of us are not this idol or, or this, this, uh, this uh, non-energetic consumerists out to maximize cheap pleasure, blinking away in sham happiness. Many of us are much more than that. There are such things as uh, you've seen the Wolves of, Wolf, of, uh, Wolves of, Wolf of Wall Street movie. Some of you have. It's been one of the most watched downloaded movie in China. Right? Um, you see uh, the, you know, kind of um, king of the world mentality that people, that people have. They work hard, they compete hard, they walk over bodies of the vanquished with smug indifference. And when they are, bent, uh, built, when they are trying to bend the shape of the world in their direction, they also think about happiness. And they say, we have invented happiness, and they mean it very seriously. They are the happiest people in the world. They think of themselves, or they want to portray themselves because deep down they know they aren't. Ruthless high achievers and connoisseurs of what are deemed to be very best things in life. These people are more like Nietzsche himself, active nihilist, than the last man that Nietzsche despised. And this is the active nihilism of Nietzsche, active nihilism where people establish their own values. 
All meaning then originates with us, and when all meaning originates with us, then we have no good reason to choose one over the other. Then nothing has authority over us, because everything that we have chosen, we can freely unchoose. Whether we dwell in modern equivalents of grand chateaus, or we live crammed in dilapidated flats beyond the railroad tracks, after we have wiped horizon clean of transcendence, we find ourselves saddled with a crashing burden of unbearably light existence. Uh, you will recall that's a phrase from Milan Kundera's uh, book, title of his book, but also he builds on Nietzsche. Now these two nihilisms, one is a nihilism of world deniers and world destroyers, religious world deniers and religious world destroyers, and the nihilism of our religious our, uh, inventors of arbitrary values. These two nihilisms struggle not only in individual souls, but they also struggle today on the world stage. Religious fundamentalists, on the one hand, clutching transcendent meaning with desperate hands, and then between those fundamentalists and our religious libertines. And those our religious libertines are often flanked by very flaccid last men seeking for ordinary comforts. Now, the two antagonisms that I've just described that mark, I think, the world stage today, they also reinforce one another. Active nihilists, for whom nothing can matter and everything is unbearably light, that kind of active nihilism cannot ultimately sustain itself. And then people flee from active nihilism into what Nietzsche called passive nihilism into transcendent values and often join the most fundamentalist of all sects. That's what's happening with Islamic State, I think, today in the, with Westerners' relation to the Islamic State in the Middle East today. It was happening a few decades ago with Red Brigades. Uh, earlier on, it was happening with Russian anarchists uh, at the end of 19th uh, century as well. Now, but in the household of passive nihilists, like fundamentalists, you have meaning. Your life has weight. But at the same time, that life squeezes all joy and pleasure out of life. And so people flee from one to the other and pendle between them. You know, Nietzsche himself in Zarathustra uh, spoke of the three metamorphoses of the spirit. Um, first metamorphosis was a camel who bears everything. <laughs> Second metamorphosis was a lion who takes the burden away, um, and that's a rebellion against the, mm, fundamentalism in a sense, right? The third metamorphosis was a child who wills his own spirit. And what Nietzsche wasn't quite aware of is that child can actually want to become a camel. And so the circle moves from camel to lion to child to camel to lion. That's the cycle in which we, I think, find ourselves uh, today. And it has bearing on many things in our life, including uh, our ability to deal with ecological issues. Let me now end by suggesting one thing. In choosing between meaning and pleasure, which is basically what these two groups are doing, right? The libertines want pleasure, the fundamentalists, they want, uh, they want meaning. And you can see why fundamentalism is attractive because the kind of meaninglessness of the life today often leads people to flee into fundamentalisms. But choosing between meaning and pleasure, we always make the wrong choice. 
Pleasure without meaning is vapid. Meaning without pleasure is crushing. In its own way, each is nihilistic. But we don't need to choose between them. And I think I want to illustrate this from the way in which you can think about the Christian faith. The unity of meaning and pleasure, which we experience as joy, is given with a God who is love. Now that conviction is the main reason why I believe that globalization needs religions. Now, how are meaning and pleasure united? With Augustine, we can argue that the relationship to God belongs to the very makeup of human beings. This is not something which we simply desire. This is something which is structurally part of who we are as human beings, whether we are aware of it or not. In all our longing, in one way or another, we also long for God. Our lives are oriented toward the infinite God, and they find meaning in relationship to God. The God who created us, the God who will bring the world together with us to consummation. Apart from God, with Earth as the sphere of our existence, and Earth in Nietzsche's term unchained from its sun, the deeper meaning of our lives escapes us. Parched for meaning, we then search to find it wherever we can. Muscle tone of our bodies, steamy sex, loads of money, success in work, fame, family, nation, you name it. We look for meaning in simply in the ordinary, good ordinary things of this life. But, hope I will not surprise you now, but looking for meaning in ordinary things is a bit like expecting sexual fulfillment from pornography. Pornography is not only unfulfilling and on top of being unfulfilling addictive, but in fact robs you of the possibility of truly enjoying ordinary sex with flesh and blood partner, with your spouse. A lot of studies in pornography show precisely that kind of emptying of the possibility of enjoyment of ordinary, uh, just on account of enjoying something that is simply a, a simulacrum of what um, ordinarily sexual satisfaction is. I think trying to find fulfillment in or, simply in ordinary things of life is a little bit like pornography. And I think it's part of it is that it stimulates ever new desires and it has absolutely no end. And that's the part of cycle uh, that speeds up our lives. That's the part of cycle that makes our lives impossible to experience contentment. One of the great challenges that we have today in contemporary setting is to think positively contentment to think positively limits. But how do you feel positively limits when every new desire isn't satisfied, isn't satisfying desire, but generates another one after it? And that, of course, advertisement feeds on this. An entire system operates precisely on this uh, mechanism. Now, you might say then when God, if you speak with kind of Nietzsche's voice, you might say when God gives meaning, does not God take away ordinary pleasures? When we embrace God, don't we have to drop the world from our hands? Isn't it either God or the world? And the answer to this question, certainly from Christian standpoint, no, it is not. If God created the material world inhabited by sentient beings, if God became flesh in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, if the bodies of those bound to God in faith and love are temples of the Holy Spirit, if the bodies of those bound to God in faith and love are, are temples of the Holy Spirit, then the opposition between attachment to God and enjoyment of ordinary things in life, it must be false. In fact, one can put it this way. 
The attachment to God amplifies and deepens enjoyment of the world. So let me try to explain what I mean, how the attachment to God can amplify enjoyment of the world. Now, consider just an ordinary object. Uh, where's my pen? Oh, I don't have it here. Well, um, pen, for instance. You might think that pen is a material thing, and it is. And you might think that pen is just a material thing, but it is not. In Phenomenology of Perceptum, Maurice Morley-Ponty argued that all cultural objects are sediments of human activity and have around them an atmosphere of humanity. You can give it a very good example. If my father gives me, when my father gave me his gold nib pelican fountain pen, every time I use my gold nib pelican fountain pen, it has an aura of my father's, who is now departed, presence around it. I enjoy this object on account of its relationship to my father. We differentiate people on this, uh, in this way, too. I'll just give you an example. I have a managing director of my center, Skip Masbach. Walter has met him. Now, he, he is a blue fountain pen guy. If I go by his office, you'll always see in a, in, in a, a cup uh, about 10 blue fountain pens sticking. Now, I am a fine point gel pen guy, <laughs> right? And Skip and I have a clear distinction, right? I, I think when I think of Skip, uh, he's a blue, blue felt pen guy. If I see blue felt pen, I don't, on, on, the, on the writing, I don't just see blue felt pen writing. I see Skip connected with blue felt pen, right? Similar true is with me. Or I have found out that two of my friends, Prince Ghazi of Jordan and David Ford of, uh, from Cambridge, they use Pilot G Tech C4 pens. Uh, I use those always. Those are my pens, right? <laughs> and I have a special affinity, very slight, uh, very trite, in a sense, affinity, but nonetheless affinity on account of this pen. Pen isn't a pen. Pen is a social relations, right? That's the point. <laughs> if you observe, you will see, pen will tell you that things aren't just things. They are social relations. And if things are social relations, this is also how pleasure works. Notice what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to articulate why relationship to God enhances pleasure. Now think about how pleasure works. In a book entitled How Pleasure Works, a colleague of mine from Yale, Paul Bloom, has convincingly demonstrated that the common sense view of pleasure is mistaken. People insist, he writes, that pleasure that they get from wine is due to its taste or smell, or that music is pleasurable because it's sound, or that movies worth watching because what is on the screen. And of course, all of this is true, but it's only partly true. The other part of pleasure, I think the bigger part of pleasure, is, has to do with social relations inhering in things. Social relations that are attached to things that we enjoy or not to enjoy. So they're attached to this wine, or in my case, to this pen. We derive a great deal of pleasure, for instance, when we think of a painting as an original, as opposed to it being fake. Uh, Paul Bloom gives an example of Vermeer that Goebbels apparently bought from one of the, of, of one of the uh, Dutch uh, dealers in art. And uh, Goebbels were and paid, I don't know how many very valuable paintings as a trade uh, for this. And Goebbels was very proud of this. And one, when he was being sentenced, then it came out that this guy has sold Vermeer to, to Goebbels. And he was tried then in, in Holland for the deed. And he said, listen, I sold Goebbels a fake. And I said, it can't be that you sold the fake. You know, he would have recognized. Well, and so finally he had to paint 
in the prison in order to show that he was capable, actually, of creating art of this sort. And sure enough, he did paint another Vermeer in, uh, in, in prison. The whole story illustrates how Goebbels had this extraordinarily pleasure of watching the original Vermeer once he became certain that it wasn't. The all pleasure was gone of this painting, right? Um, original because of the attachment to the author is important. Or the other example that Paul uh, gives is how much is a measuring tape worth? How much do you pay in Switzerland for a measuring tape? Five, nice measuring tape, maybe five Swiss francs right, or something like that. Somebody paid 48.875 thousand dollars, 48, for almost 49 thousand dollars for a measuring tape because it belonged to John F. Kennedy. <laughs> Attachment to a person, right, is significant for the enjoyment and value of the object. Put it in theological language, we enjoy things most when we experience them as sacraments, as carriers of the presence of another. Now think of the world as a gift, the entirety of it, all individual things in it and all of it together. And to think of a gift, of, a, of world as a gift, you must also think of a giver. That would be God, creator and sustainer of the world. And then there's you, the recipient. We have a giver, God, we have recipient, you and us. We have a gift that is a world. And the gift is not an object as such, right? A gift is a relationship. If you go to a gift store, what you buy are things that at the moment you buy them become gifts and with the intention of giving them to somebody else. Gift is a relationship between giver, the thing, and the gift. There are three always involved in gift giving. If the world is a gift, then all things to which you relate and many things to which you don't are a gift of God to you. Now imagine that you really like the giver. Imagine that you're a good Jew or a good Christian, that you love God with all your heart, that you love your neighbor as yourself. Now spread the wings of your fancy bold, boldly. Imagine that your, all of your neighbors do the same. Imagine that everybody in the world does the same. Now that's exactly, I think, how Christians have imagined the world to come, the world of love. If that is the case, all relationships, absolutely all relationships, are marked by love. Each distant start and every gentle touch, each face and every whiff of freshly plowed earth, each blade of grass, you can say, in some literally every good and beautiful thing now shimmers with aura both vibrantly real and undetectable to our senses. Each thing in the world is more than itself. And just because it is such, it is a source of many layered and deep pleasure. When we experience ordinary things of life as God's gifts, when we rejoice in experiencing them as such, the world, in a sense, has reached its completion, at least for the duration of time that we have this experience. When I was recently in Israel, I was talking to, a, I was celebrating Shabbat with uh, one of my good friends, rabbis, and then we were reading texts, uh, and one of the texts was by uh, a current, um, I think ultra orthodox uh, rabbi writing about Sabbath. And one of the things that I've learned from this writing is that Sabbath is not about not working. Sabbath is simply, Sabbath is not simply about you not letting others work for you, which is also socially very important element. Sabbath is primarily about cessation of striving. I stop striving and I turn to God and to the world and enjoy the world and rejoice in the world as a gift. 
on this one day of the week, the day toward which all days are aiming and from which all gain meaning. That's at least how Jews think about Sabbath. On this one day, human striving comes to an end and the joy in the world as a gift and in God as a giver reigns supreme. On the seventh day of creation, if you're Christian, make it the eighth day of creation, as Berjaev has argued so well. We don't go through the things of ordinary like life to somehow delight in something deeper, which is God. We actually delight in the world and in God at the same time. Globalization processes affirm, want to affirm, the ordinary life. And yet, just in the way in which they affirm ordinary life, they subvert them as a source of pleasure at the same time. I've got one iPhone, and, which is now four, right? I'm two iPhones behind, um, <laughs> right? New one comes, I want uh, another one. Uh, everything that comes and what drives the globalization is this systematically produced mis un discontentment with the things that we have and that we things we are supposed to enjoy. We need to rediscover God's gift of creation and rejoice anew in God and in the world as God has created. And this, I think, would be one of the most fundamental contribution that faiths, that Christian faith can make to globalization processes as they are experienced today. Thank you very much.